Good morning. It's good to see you this morning here. Welcome to Faith Community. We're excited. Hello. We are excited to be in the house of the Lord here today. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians this morning, and uh, if you have need of a Bible, these gentlemen here would love to put one in your hand. So if you forgot yours, didn't bring one, whatever, uh, feel free to um, avail yourself of this. We are in 1 Thessalonians this morning, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And this morning we're talking about the goal of discipleship. And you can see here that we have a, a slide behind me. I'm going to call it the, my zombie slide. <laughs> the guy right behind Jesus looks like a zombie to me. I mean, I'm not going to kid you. And, and if you look at the last guy, the guy at the far right, who does that look like? Does anybody see JFK there? Seriously, how about it? I think if we look long enough, we might be able to find John Wayne, but that's for another time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 this morning, the Apostle Paul is, is recounting some of the activities among the Thessalonican Christians, and he begins there in verse 1 by saying, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. And he recounts how the gospel of Jesus Christ was presented to these fine folks and ultimately what their response would be. These believers at Thessalonica have had their lives changed forever. And the full impact of the gospel is what we're witnessing here in this passage of Scripture. And the reality is that the gospel as it's been presented, the good news as it were, the fact that Jesus, the Messiah, has come, he has paid the penalty for our sin on the cross of Calvary, only to rise from the dead three days later, and now is the object of our faith. That good news is transforming people, not only in Thessalonica, but all around the world. And this goes way back, and here we are in 2016, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is still transforming people. Now what I find that's so fascinating in this passage of Scripture is what we're going to see in verse 12, where the Bible talks about the essence of discipleship and what the goal of discipleship truly, truly is. But you don't have discipleship until you, first of all, have evangelism. That is people coming and placing their faith in Jesus. That's where it all begins, doesn't it? And so let's ask the Lord to bless as we go through this passage and see as this develops before our eyes today. Father, may we come to your word this morning humbled by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and humbled by the weight of the cross, the weight of our Savior, his significance in our life. Father, may we see as we investigate this passage of Scripture what the true goal of discipleship is. And help us, Father, to seek in our walk with you to draw closer and closer to you, allowing our hearts to be discipled day by day. So work through your word, I pray today. Minister to our hearts, I ask in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. This morning, we're going to look, first of all, at the beginning, and really, when you think of the goal of discipleship, it has to begin with the presentation of the Word of God, and this is where we see the Apostle Paul, and he's recounting what has happened here as he's come to the church at Thessalonica. Of course, it's the city of Thessalonica that he comes to. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 17 that for three Sabbath days, he is there, and he is working in that synagogue teaching about Jesus. And he says to these folks here in verse 1, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you is not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. The Apostle Paul came, and it was not an easy task to be able to explain that Jesus saves to a group of people who are absolutely unknown to him. 
I want you to understand that it's difficult at times, especially when you stand in front of an audience that you're not familiar with. I remember uh, the first time I came and preached here. And I thought, oh, all these people, uh, I wonder who they are. And I, I wonder if they're going to, 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 to respond to the word. And uh, it's interesting as you get comfortable in preaching and you get comfortable in ministering, you start to know people and you know where they sit and you know how they smile and, and you get a feel for it all. And it's not like you're standing up in front of strangers anymore. I remember one time when I did a, a, a wedding on the beach way off on, uh, uh, on the shore up in Massachusetts. And I remember there was about 300 people there and I knew uh, pretty likely not one of them was a believer. And as I began to tell about Christ in Ephesians chapter 5 and talk about love as it's exemplified in the church and the relationship to the Savior, Jesus, I could see their faces growing angrier and angrier. Well, I must confess, this past weekend on Friday, I drove up to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and I went to the sportsman's show up there. Man, is that place intense. There are just acres upon acres upon acres of deer heads and moose heads and elk heads and fishing trips and Alaskan guys, and there were Argentinians talking some language that I didn't understand. I mean, it was amazing. It went on and on forever. It was intense. And on Friday night... The guy from Duck Dynasty, that Phil Robertson guy, you know, the guy that looks like ZZ Top, you know, the long beard, he was speaking in the arena. And, and so if you bought a $20 ticket, you got into the show for free. And so I got into the show for free, and I went down to hear Phil speak to the crowd. And he was supposed to speak on, on God, guns, and the country. He says, that's in my wheelhouse. And so out he comes, he's, he's all dressed in camouflage, you know, just like he is on the TV show. And he comes walking on out and, and, and he begins by having this big satchel over his shoulder. Now there are thousands of people uh, that have paid 20, 30 bucks to be able to listen to him. And most of them are coming because they think he's funny on the TV show or that sort of thing. And so he comes out, and he's got this big satchel, it's all camo, everything's camo with him, and he comes out and he sets that satchel down, and these satchels, just so you know, if you're a duck hunter, you know that in that satchel you put your, your shells, your shotgun shells, you put your duck calls, your goose calls, you might even put your sandwich in there, and, and you kind of put it over your shoulder. And so out comes Phil with this thing, and, and I'm thinking, you know, because he's a world champion duck caller, and I'm thinking maybe he's going to call a few ducks and see if we can get a few flying around the auditorium. And he comes out and he opens up this satchel and he pulls out the biggest Bible I think I've ever seen. I mean, this Bible is enormous and it's worn, it's tattered, it's torn, it's, it's maroon and it's got like a rope around the edges of it. I don't know. And, and, and he gets up there and he begins by speaking about God. And you'll never wear, guess what passage Phil went to. He went to Romans chapter 1 and he started in verse 18. And I'm telling you what, he's up there, he's got that beard, you know, and he's just, he's just bringing it. He's just bringing it. And, and you're in this big thing, and I'm watching people get up and walk out. Oh, yeah. And, and there's a big barrier about, a bit, about four or five feet high, a big metal fence that goes all the way across the auditorium. And there's one little place where you can get in on either end, and there's a big security guard there in a yellow jacket. And, and he's sitting there, and, and all of a sudden these people rush the far side. And they pushed that security guy out of the way, and they came running up to the stage, and, and, and there's Phil, and, and he's, he's in the word, and he's giving the word, and these people came up, and this guy starts shouting to the crowd. And this woman came up, and she had a big sign, and, and I don't know what she was saying. I don't know what they were protesting. I think there was something about animals, maybe. Phil never looked up. He kept going with boldness. And he kept giving, and I, as soon as those people came up there, I realized, and I started praying, and I know there were hundreds of people probably in that place praying for him. He just gave the gospel. He said, you know, those people that were just here, God loves them. That's why Jesus Christ came. Came for people like me, came for people like them, came for all of us, you see. 
And you know, that took such boldness to be able to go through and give the gospel of Jesus Christ just straight up. That man knows the word of God. He started to quote Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, and he just gave the whole plan of salvation right there. And he gave testimony to the fact that thousands of people are coming to Christ, and I could see exactly what he meant by that. And you should have heard the reactions of people, non-believers, who were walking out of there afterwards. I heard people say, well, you'll never get me in a church. And I thought, man, you didn't have to go to church to hear the gospel. I heard someone else say, what did you think of that? And I kind of thought that this was a believer who maybe brought an unbelieving friend. And he said, well, he was kind of funny. And I thought, that's the one thing he wasn't. You see, the word of God, as it goes forth with power, needs to go forth with a boldness. And it's so easy for you and I to shrink back from sharing Christ. Isn't it true? We, we should pray for boldness. We should pray for each other to be bold in the faith and to be able to share it. Paul says that I got out of uh, Philippi, and you'll notice there in verse 2, he says, I was spitefully treated there in Philippi. He is coming out of Philippi, and he is moving, I'm telling you. And he comes to, to this city of Thessalonica, and, and after being uh, treated so poorly there in Philippi, and you know the story there, he comes to Thessalonica, but he doesn't back down even one speck. He keeps giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, we are bold in our God to speak to you the gospel in much conflict. You see, when Paul came and he brought the gospel, he presented it, first of all, purely. I notice there in verse 3, for our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But we had been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Paul came, he presented the gospel purely. He had a pure motive. There was no gimmicks, there was no trickery. As he presented the gospel, he depended upon the Holy Spirit of God to take the gospel, the good news, as it were, and, and embed it into the hearts of these people so that they would be faced with a choice to place their faith in Christ or reject it. And Paul looks at that and he says, we are all about doing what God wanted us to do. The gospel of Jesus Christ should never resort to gimmicks or trickery, Amen. There should never be that. I remember when we used to, for years, we ran basketball uh, tournaments and teams would come from six, seven hours away to play in our tournament. They loved our tournament. We gave away ginormous trophies and they just absolutely loved it. But every single time we had an advertisement for our basketball tournament, we always referenced the fact that a gospel presentation would be given. Didn't want to fool anyone. When Jim Cimbala was speaking a couple weeks ago at the pastor's conference, he made mention of the fact he was watching TV and there was someone on TV who said, if you'll just send in some money, uh, we'll give you a word from God. And Cimbala's wife leaned over and said, you can change the channel anytime. <laughs> you see, people have resorted to gimmicks and they've resorted to trickery. The apostle Paul could say, I've not done any of those things. I came to you with a, a pure heart because... I was much more impressed with the need to speak so that God approved than for man to approve. Do you see the importance of that? You see, when we come and we worship God, it's all about us pleasing God, isn't it? That's who we want to please. Why, why should we care if we please men? Our first objective is to please God. If you're teaching a Sunday school class or you're preaching a message or you're just talking with someone, understand that our responsibility first and foremost is to God. That's who we want to be satisfied. That's who we worship. In fact, when we come together for worship, even in a service like this one, as we come together for worship, our primary goal is to exalt God. Have you ever asked yourself who is the audience in a worship service like this one? Most of the time, I'm standing up front on Sunday mornings. It was a wonderful experience for me to hear some 15 messages down at the pastor's conference a couple weeks ago. I love sitting there. I love listening to people open the word of God. What a joy, what a blessing that is to my heart. 
I could have sat there and said, that Jim Cimbala, you know, he could dress better than that. His tie does not match his jacket. <laughs> you could be sitting there this morning going, what is wrong with Cassidy's tie? Doesn't that guy shine his shoes? You see, it's, it's, it, it's easy for us to think of ourselves as the audience when we're sitting in a worship service, but there is only one person in the audience, and that's God. You see, you're not part of an audience. You're part of worshiping God sitting right where you are. And as I sat there and I listened to message after message after message, I came to understand how important it was for me because even as I sat there listening to the messages, I realized that it was all about God. You see, he was the focal point. And what God was trying to do in my life, he, he, he was speaking to my heart about things. He was working on, on issues in my heart and issues in my life and barriers to, to godliness. And, and God is trying to tear those things down. And as I'm sitting there listening to these messages, I'm thinking to myself, I need to be moldable in his hand. I need to be humbled by his word. Because at the end of the day, it's all about pleasing God, isn't it? It really is. So Paul was able to say, please God. Notice verse 5. He says, for neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak, he says, uh, of covetousness. The Apostle Paul comes not only with purity, but he comes with sincerity. The word flattering lips, the word flattering literally means to subordinate yourself to someone else so that you could have personal gain. He's, he didn't do that. He didn't come in and say, you know, hey, listen, you guys are just terrific and, and try to, to subordinate himself or, or speak to them in such a way as to build them up in a false way. You know, I hear people do that with the gospel of Jesus Christ today all the time. It reminds me of Eddie Haskell. Do you remember Eddie Haskell on Leave it to Beaver? You know, oh, Mrs. Cleaver, what a beautiful dress you have on today. Meanwhile, he's scheming to take over the world with all evil and in malice and terrible intent, right? I mean, it's like, you know, he's up to no good, this guy. And, and, and this is kind of where Paul is saying, listen, we didn't come with any type of ulterior motive. There was no agenda. We are not seeking to build you guys up and say nice things about you, so you say nice things about us. We're here with sincerity. The cloak of covetousness is that cloak, is that outer garment. It's something that could easily cover a sinful heart, and God was witness to Paul's heart. And not only did Paul present the gospel with purity and sincerity, he also presented it sacrificially. Notice in verse 6, he says, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. You see, the apostle of Christ was entitled to receive for his labor wages, but Paul would work in the secular world so that not, there would not be a stumbling block. He didn't seek glory. He didn't seek wealth. He received nothing but simply to come and present the gospel. And so the first part of discipleship begins with the presentation of the word. Aren't you glad that whoever shared Christ with you was bold? They shared Christ with you. They didn't care what your reaction was. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that when they brought you the gospel of Jesus Christ, it wasn't attached with any bad doctrine? It was pure? It required just faith in Jesus. There were no works associated with it. Paul presents the gospel, but salvation is not where the process stops. Notice with me here in verse 12. You ever read a book and you're reading a book and you want to get to the end to find out if the guy lives or not or whatever, and so you kind of cheat and go to the end? That's what we're going to do. This, this passage of Scripture, you could actually have, I could have preached it in two different ways. I could have just talked about the gospel being presented, or I could talk about the, the goal of discipleship. Instead, I try to put them together, so I think it makes more sense, at least it does to me. In verse 12, Paul gives to us pretty much the weight of discipleship. And he begins the whole discussion back up there in verse 11, for he says here certain things that we need to know. Now, when you think of life and you think of discipleship, 
the picture in back of me is the picture of a famous arch in Thessalonica. And underneath that arch is the main thoroughfare, the Ignatian Way, that, that people would travel. It's one of the Roman roads that was built there. And so the gospel freely could go in a person's heart from one place to the next. And what God does is he takes normal people, like the Thessalonican people, and he begins to work in their life. And there's some people that are walking underneath that, just doing life. And in the midst of doing life, they have come into contact with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it begins to change everything. Now, the Bible is going to give us something that's very, very important here. And the reason why I know it's important is because Paul is going to say it three different ways. He says here in verse 11, as you know, we exhorted, we comforted, and we charged every one of you as a father does his own children. Here's Paul's ministry of, first of all, exhorting. He is going to say exhortation. And he is going to, with this exhortation, basically tell the people, this is what is important. If I exhort you to do something, you get the idea, the meaning of the word to exhort. I'm exhorting you. You know, here it is. This is something of, of value. This is something of substance. Listen to it. Second thing he did was he would encourage them. And when he's encouraging them, and it's interesting, this word actually gives you kind of a, it's the idea of being soothing in a soothing and an encouraging way, he is going to be exhorting them. So you've got this exhorting going on. You've got this encouraging going on. And then the last word, and in the New King James, it's going to say uh, there that he is charging every one of them. But in the New American Standard, it says he is imploring them. And that word is an interesting word. It carries with it the idea of testifying. The root is that word for martyr, actually. In, in other words, to invoke witnesses. You might think of the passage in Hebrews it talks about there. But literally, it's the idea of to declare uh, solemnly uh, something that's of importance, to insist upon something. So you get the idea of imploring. Now, one thing you'll notice is that with every one of those words, the I-N-G is attached to the end. It's not attached to the end in the New King James, but in the original and New American Standard, it is going to be an ongoing present action. And it's actually plural as well. So this is not just Paul, it's his whole team. It's Paul, it's Silas, it's Timothy. They had a ministry of exhorting, of encouraging and inspiring and, and really imploring that these people would see something that was tremendously important. Now, if I line this up and I say, okay, here's something really significant. It's exhorting, it's encouraging, it's imploring. You got to ask the natural question, what? <laughs> what are you imploring me? What are you, what are you, what are you exhorting me to do? What are, what are you inspiring me to do? Are you with me? What is it that's so important? Here are these verses, just as you know how we were exhorting, encouraging, and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that, and you get that so that, that little clause in the Greek that's going to give you purpose. Here's the main purpose. This is the goal of discipleship. The purpose is to walk in a manner worthy of, of the God who called you. Walking worthy. The word walk, peri. It's a compound word in the Greek. It has two of these aspects, the walk, peri, and pateto. The idea to walk around. What this spoke about that was so important was it really addresses moral conduct in daily living. You remember those people who are walking under that archway? They're walking through life. They're just doing life. And as they're doing life, the gospel of Jesus Christ has impacted them. And now the way that they walk, their, their habitual conduct of daily life needs to be influenced because now the gospel of Jesus Christ has transformed their heart from the inside. He says you need to walk worthy of the manner of what you're called, worthy of God. How, how much has God impacted their life? 
Think of a scale, right? Think of a, a scale, and on the one hand, you have, you have Jesus Christ who's entered into your life. How much has Christ impacted your life? Let me ask you that. Is it really a significant weight in your life? And what Paul is saying is, here's what discipleship is. Discipleship is, if this is a heavy weight in your life, and Jesus Christ is that important, then you need to walk in a way that reflects that significance. Whew. I'm looking at this and I'm going, oh Lord, help me. Help me to live my life with that type of emphasis, that type of weightedness, so that I can reflect the God who's called me. It's pretty important, isn't it? See, that's what discipleship is. And these people were learning. They were just trying to learn. Uh, they needed to know a lot of stuff because they had no points of reference to an ethic that was different. Uh, they'd been following in paganism, and in Thessalonica, they, they were all about idols and, and worshiping these idols. Idols were everywhere. Remember Mount Olympus, they would go up and they would, so they would sell all of these things in little gift shops, all these souvenirs, and people would buy an idol. They'd have an idol for this, an idol for that, and so the pagan religion of the day was this idol worship. But then there were also, under the shield of religion, those prostitutes and fornicators galore. You see, it was an immoral society not unlike our society today. You see, they didn't know how to live. They didn't have a measure of understanding here with this. And so Paul is saying, this is what your life's gonna be all about. It's gonna be putting a weightedness in your life to reflect Jesus and how important he is to you. This is the goal this is what we want to see accomplished. Even in the midst of living life, my main goal and my main purpose is to reflect Christ and the significance of Christ in my life. Are you with me? That's where we all ought to be as followers of Jesus Christ. I, I, we really have to separate it out. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, you don't know what's going on in my life. You're right, and you don't know what's going on in mine. But the one thing I can tell you for sure is that you and I have, as followers of Jesus Christ, the same objectives in our life. And that is, that is to live out our faith. It's almost like here we are with this tunnel vision, and, and I've got stuff in my life, and I've got problems, and I've got trials, and you've got trials, and you've got issues and things that you're dealing with as well. But the focal point of my life and the focal point of your life is to walk in a manner worthy of Jesus Christ. Despite what's going on, despite what's happening, this is what we're called to do. I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to go back and just, and the second point is that, that the word of God and this goal of discipleship continues with the expansion of the word. And, and you see the Apostle Paul's compassionate ministry. I just wanna pick this out because it's twofold here because you have this reference that's wonderful back here um, and I have to flip my page to go back, but he says here in verse seven, but we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. And Paul was calling to remembrance his relationship to these people. He says, I was like, it's just like a nursing mom. A nursing mom who's nourishing and cherishing that child. How gentle a picture. Isn't that the most gentle picture you can see? What a beautiful picture. This was the same terminology that was used for a mother bird who would warm the bird, baby's bird food in its mouth and then spit it into the baby's mouth. Just so compassionate. Now, these people didn't have a lot of points of reference. You couldn't go on. Paul says, I didn't go in and beat him over the head with the Bible. I went in and I lovingly nourished them and showed them what this new life in Christ looked like. Because as they looked around, they were confused by the world that they live in. You and I, we're facing a new generation that's going to be confused by this world and the ethical positions of this world. 
You can't turn on TV and watch TV and find, find normal husband-wife relationships. Everything's fornication. Everything's fornication. I, I, I'm, I'm, my mind's blown by it. It is so normal, it is so natural that people in our day will grow up and they will think that that must be the way you live life. And so we nurture them, we, we come alongside of, of that disciple and we show them here in a loving way, this is what Jesus is all about and this is what he has said in his word. Not only does Paul and the apostles have a compassionate ministry, but they had an effective ministry. They came in and they were blameless. Notice verse 10, your witnesses in God also. How devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. We came in and acted as a father acts. He says we exhorted and comforted and charged Every one of you as a father does his own children. And I thought, what a great analogy. On the one hand, you have the mom, and she's, she's nourishing the baby and the child and, and just, you know, just giving them the love. And, and then you have dad, and at times dads nurture too, and, and sometimes moms nurture and exhort. I guess we, we all do the same thing, but the picture is wonderful here, isn't it? Because what Paul is saying is, we were exhorting you, and we were imploring you, and we were encouraging you as a father would his own children. We were there for you. We were cheering you on so that you would do the right thing. And this has a powerful effect upon these people and the discipleship that they're going through. Last but not least, Paul says in verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Do you realize that you and I are part of the kingdom of God if we have placed our faith in Jesus? Do you realize that? Think of Romans 8, 28. It talks about the the fact that all things work together for good uh, to them who are called according to his purpose. God has a plan. Uh, We are part Because of our faith, we're part of a spiritual kingdom today. Isn't that fantastic? My my citizenship is is not here in Maryland or the United States or even planet Earth. I certainly can say I have dual citizenship. (laughs) Because I have a citizenship that's in heaven because I'm part of that spiritual kingdom of God. And one day, God's spiritual kingdom will be here on this earth. Paul wanted them to know that they were part of something much bigger. So that as they looked at their own relationship to God, they had to understand that I am a citizen. The kingdom of God. Paul would say our citizenship is in heaven. And truly that is the reality for us as followers of Jesus Christ. And so why is that important? It's important because as I look at that, I need to be reminded that that's ultimately who I am. Because it gives me strength and it gives me the desire to live the life that Christ wants me to live. To make certain that Christ is so weighty in my life that there's nothing else that's more important in my life than Jesus Christ. This is what you and I are called to do. Paul wants to remind us of this important aspect God would challenge all of us to look into our life, the daily habit of how we live life, to expose whether or not we really are walking worthy in a worthy manner of the one who has called us. What a task. People that poll the church find that the saddest of sad things is truly happening in the church, and that is they are finding very little difference in the way people that don't name the name of Jesus live and how people who name the name of Jesus live. And we don't want to have that said about us, do we? This is what discipleship is. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, how to live. Teach me, Lord, how to walk in a way that is befitting a person who names the name of Jesus Christ. 
May we seek to make this a priority in our lives. And if you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, let me urge you today to make the decision to lay hold of the grace of God because there is only one way to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. You might have heard it said that there are a lot of different ways, you know, and, and you can hear people that call themselves Christians say, well, there's many different ways to get into the kingdom of heaven. But I remind you of Jesus' words when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father unless it's through me. Have you placed your faith in Jesus? Has your life been transformed? And if it has, how is your walk? Let's pray. In a moment, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper and take communion together as a church. But you may be here this morning and perhaps you've never placed faith in Jesus and in him alone. I wonder today if you're unsettled in your heart, you're uneasy about the future, you're struggling with life, And today you would say, Lord, I need help. There is not one who is righteous, no, not one. All of sin comes short of the glory of God, but Jesus Christ has come to pay the price of our sin. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God's speaking in my heart about where I'm going to spend my eternity. If that is in your heart today, I'd love to pray for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Kevin, God has spoken to my heart, and I, I know that I've put my faith in Jesus, but I'm concerned there are some areas in my life that don't reflect the weightedness of Jesus Christ in my heart. My walk's not what it should be. There are areas I need help with. And maybe you're here today and you're like me. You say, Pastor Kevin, I, I need help. I've said, Lord, I need help. <laughs> Lord, there's some things we need to work on. <laughs> I'd love to pray for you this morning. If you're like me and say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. Would you just raise your hand? I'd love to pray for you this morning. Things to work on. Amen. 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 I'm just honest before the Lord. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning again and you say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I need to place my faith in Jesus. I've never done that. Pray for me too. Just slip up your hand also, would you? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done in accomplishing for us the opportunity for salvation. Father, how we thank you for sending Jesus to die for the sins of the whole world. And Lord, I lift up my brothers and sisters in Christ and along with them pray, Father, that you would work in areas of our life that need attention. That, Father, we might be a true reflection of a disciple of Jesus Christ. That we would put enough weight and emphasis in our life about how we walk so that we're a true reflection of our Savior. Father, we know we'll never be perfect, but oh, Lord, how we long to be. Give us strength, Lord, I pray. Give us wisdom and understanding that we might honor you with our life. And I pray this in all in Jesus' name.